Are you a businesswoman who is finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. Every week, get valuable lessons from Elizabeth or learn from her roundtable conversations with experts and speakers on how to make a difference, not just a point. On to the show with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. Hello, and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host, and this is the podcast where we talk about leadership, communication, presentation skills, diversity, and so much more, all the things that are involved in showing up as a leader. Before I go into my very interesting guest today, I'd like to invite you to see where your presentation skills are strong by taking our quiz at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. And that's where you can see in four minutes where your presentation skills are strong and where perhaps a little bit of support could get you the results you need and the recognition you deserve. My guest today is Dr. Mitchell Cusey, otherwise known as Mitch who uh, has been a guest on this podcast before, and he was so cool, I brought him back. He's a 2005 Fulbright Scholar in Organizational Development and a professor at the Graduate School of Leadership and Change at Antioch University. Mitch's passion is co-designing work cultures to promote improved staff and customer experiences that increase team performance, everyday civility, and the bottom line. Mitch has consulted and been a keynote speaker with hundreds of organizations nationally and internationally, helping create work cultures of respectful engagement in impacting individual team and bottom line performance. He's previously headed leadership and organizational development at American Express Financial Advisors and Health Partners. His client list ranges from A to Z, from AT&T to firms in New Zealand. Mitch's recent work is with the Healthy Workforce Institute, focusing on increasing civility in the healthcare field. Mitch is a best-selling author with six business books and over 100 research-to-practice articles. His most recent book is Why I Don't Work Here Anymore. By the way, there's a link in the show notes. And he's also the recipient of the Minnesota Organizational Development Practitioner of the Year Award, lives with his husband in Minneapolis and Palm Springs. He's a lovely guy. We had a very interesting conversation, a very useful conversation full of practical tips. I know you'll enjoy it. On to the interview with Dr. Mitchell Cusey. Mitch Cusey, welcome back to Speakers Who Get Results. I'm glad to have you. It's really great to be here. I really uh, loved our conversation just a few months ago. I was delighted that... uh, You asked me to come back. Well, I do remember saying last time, you're one of those people who, once we met, I thought, why haven't we been friends for years? Of course, (laughs) we need to have been friends for years. We just, that's the kind of thing. But before I get into the list of questions I have for you, let me ask you this time around, who would be your dream interview? If you could interview someone who would not normally be accessible, who would it be? What would you ask them? And who should be listening? I would have to say Barbara Streisand. Ooh, cool. She was in Funny Girl. And what would be a question that I would ask her? Barbara said that she doesn't read music. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask her how in the world she learns to sing a song Particularly if it's a brand new one, like when in 19, let's say 62, Mm -hmm. when she was learning, I would assume, Funny Girl and some of the stuff. How did she learn that? As an organizational psychologist and looking at learning, that would be a question I would ask her. Well, I know that she did learn to read music because... Oh, um, she did? Because, this is my Barbara Streisand story, um, one level removed... When she did the movie, The Mirror Has Two Faces, yes. at the end, they're in the middle of West End Avenue, 
New York City. And it's Italian neighbor in his window, looking down at her and Jeff Bridges, embracing in the middle of the street. And he starts singing Nessun Dorma from yes. Turandot. That was Carlo Shabelli, a wonderful friend and colleague of mine, wonderful tenor who's sadly no longer with us. And he told us the story of going to audition for this. And Nessun Dorma says that the, the day is coming. You know, I I will win because the dawn is breaking. And it was filmed at dawn. Although Barbara Streisand didn't actually know what the words meant. She just liked the tune. But he went down to Los thing. Angeles to audition. And then she said, wow, you sing great. That's great. Let's talk. Do you know this one? And she sat down at the piano and started going through her music and they jammed for an hour just going through saying, oh, do you know this song? I know this song. Let's sing it. And went through an hour's worth of just finding cool things to sing. And um, by the end of it, he said, uh, so do you have the job? She said, oh, yeah, 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 sure, 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 you got the job. Now let's sing something else. So she, at that point, she had learned how to read music. Well, I am going to be Googling this later because I'm excited. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's what I would have asked her. Okay, well, I'm sure you would find many of other things to ask her once you got on stage with her <laughs> yes. and we're, yes, and we're interviewing her. So Mitch, you are an organizational psychologist. You're particularly known for helping have civil workplaces, yes. civility in the workplaces, um, politeness, if you will. And um, last time we talked about how do you deal with toxic people in your workplace? That was last time we talked, uh, we were still in lockdown. And now the COVID has that the COVID restrictions are mostly over, but the economy is people are scared about the economy. Um, frankly, I think some of that's manufactured, but you know, a lot of people are nervous. There have been many, many, many rounds of layoffs since the beginning of 2023. And yet every business owner or manager I know is desperate to find good employees. So I'm curious, um, what are you seeing? Can you explain this dichotomy? Well, what's really interesting is that many managers don't see how the culture of an organization impacts the business. Okay. And one thing is when you were when you started today and you asked about or shared that I had said that my business is about being polite, et cetera. I want to just take a slight civil. diversion from that. Civil, civil, you're right. Um, because sometimes we have to be direct with individuals, mm -hmm. um, but you're absolutely right to be what I call is respectful engagement. So okay. sometimes we do have to be honest, but it, one sort of litmus test I tell leaders is, are you doing this to prove you're right? Or are you doing this to change behavior? If you're mm. doing this to prove you're right, stop it. Stop it right now. So now I'm going to answer your, your question about what I'm seeing is many uh, business owners and managers don't get it. That um, culture is key. They think it's uh, the soft stuff. And one of the things I say to my clients is the soft stuff is really the hard stuff. For example, yeah. there there have been studies, and one in particular I'm thinking about that 70% of individuals said that they would refuse a job if that organization or the department was known to have a bad culture. Mm -hmm. And exactly. the second part is even more revealing. 65% said better pay wouldn't even be tempting. So mm -hmm. I'm seeing... In newspaper all the time, we got to pay people more. We got to pay people more. Um, Gen Z, Gen X wants more money, et cetera. And you know what? Maybe some do, but maybe some baby boomers and traditionalists want more money. Mm -hmm. But again, remember that statistic, 65% said that better pay wouldn't even be tempting. They're not going to go into a toxic culture. Mm -hmm. So what I'm seeing is that many managers and business owners still don't get it. And when we were in lockdown 
and businesses were thriving because we figured out we saved money on offices and um, people were working at home and um, people were buying, buying, buying. Everything was going well. And now we're seeing sort of a, a somewhat of a reverse trend. So subsequently, culture is key. It's mm -hmm. not just superfluous. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I, I realized after I had asked you that question that also quite possibly one of the things that's happening is that the people who are deciding about layoffs are not the people who are leading the teams. Right. You know, the layoffs are coming from the finance department, for instance, right. or are you know, people said, well, we've got to cut money. We, we've got to cut expenses. And, you know, your employees are always your highest expense. They are your highest employees are also your highest value. Exactly. But if you see human beings as an expense, then that's something. I know you said that managers don't get it. What can you do if you are working for a manager who doesn't get it? If you believe in your company and what your company does, but your manager doesn't understand that they need to treat you with respectful engagement, your phrase, how can we sort of manage up, if you will? Yeah, well, first of all, share the evidence. In uh, my latest book, Why I Don't Work Here Anymore, that was based upon a research study I had done with Dr. Elizabeth Holloway on toxic behaviors in organizations. One of the things that um, I have discovered is that by addressing toxic behaviors mm -hmm. and organizations can save approximately 6% of total compensation costs. So if organizations are spending, let's just say, 100 million on compensation, you could save 6 million minimally by addressing toxic behaviors. Many leaders don't understand that. They don't understand the, the, the why of this. Why? Because when you address this, less that you'll have less turnover because we know from other research studies, um, for example, one from Pearson and Porath, and they wrote the book, um, The Cost of Bad Behavior, they found that 12% of individuals are likely or quit because of these bad mm -hmm. toxic behaviors. So first of all, it's turnover, uh, training new people to come in. The costs just escalate. So what do you do? First of all, it's really important to have a conversation with that individual about what you're experiencing. Share some of the evidence. Great, Share a great article. Share something that you read in a book. It doesn't have to be my book, but some evidence that says we need to do something about this. Also, one thing I hear from my clients is sometimes, particularly if the manager happens to be toxic, um, demonstrating disruptive behaviors, people are afraid to give them feedback. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I say as a strategy is don't if if other people are experiencing this, talk to the manager, um, go in mass to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it it allays some of the anxiety. And I, I think there's a high probability that a manager isn't going to fire five individuals um, by saying, here are some things that, that we're experiencing. So one is going to the individual. And then secondly, what you say to that individual. And I have a four-step process. It's called intro, uh, behavior, impact, tossback. So, for example, intro we would like to talk with you about something that is um, bothering us and preventing our team from being as effective as possible. Intro. Behavior. What we'd like to talk with you about is these team meetings when you are interrupting us many times and we can't finish our sentences and feel that we're not valued on the team. Mm -hmm. Behavior. Uh, pardon me. Intro. Behavior impact the impact is we're starting to shut down and we don't and, and our creativity is descending toss back when might be a good time to talk with you about this mm. so it's it's really important to have that kind of conversation and if it helps do it with others there also if you're the only one experiencing that and you have a human resources professional mm -hmm. there go in with the human resources 
resource professional and have the conversation. The conversation is better coming from the individual experiencing this uh -huh. or individuals. So those are some, you know, immediate kinds of to do's. Uh -huh. Well, I've noticed that uh, certainly I've been in a position where I was the designated target. The manager didn't like me. And uh, so it, everything was my fault. Nobody else wanted to be the target. So no one else would stand up for me. Uh, I've been in that one. Somehow, sometimes it seems since so many people have been laid off, a lot of CEOs or upper managers, directors, et cetera, um, seem to be happily returning to the old system of treating their employees like peons, like just like the the peasants. And we are the elite. So we are we are here. We answer to our shareholders on the stock market, and we don't really care what 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 the little people think. It feels that way. I don't know if that's just from rumors I've heard from clients, or if there's a way of. It seems like it feels like backsliding. I don't know if you've seen this, um, or is it just that I'm being made aware of things that have always been there? You know. I really don't know the answer to that one. I actually have to say I haven't been experiencing that. Now, remember, with my clients, they're coming to me and they're saying something's wrong here. I want to change the culture of this organization. I want to do something about it. So there's a different momentum going mm -hmm. on. So the good news is I don't want to say I'm not experiencing that. Obviously, something is going on in these organizations where – um, I'm coming in, helping them begin change the culture. And they're telling me these kinds of things. But it's spearheaded by individ an individual or, or individuals who are in key positions saying, you know, something's awry and I want us to get back on track. We're seeing individuals who are backstabbing others. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of gossip going around. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just so many things that they are starting to erode our team effectiveness. What can you do, Mitch? I don't want to say you're not hopeful. I, I can't think of the right word, but I, I'd have to say I'm more hopeful. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, let me phrase this a different way then. Quite often, people in charge are, and you know, their managers, they tend to be control freaks and they are threatened by anyone in their team who is talented moving up. Um, I have a client now where we're dealing with um, her boss controls access to the rest of the company and he takes credit for all her ideas. I see that as a scarcity mindset, as someone who thinks a sort of a zero sum game, if my team member does well, that's gonna damage me because she had an idea that I didn't have. Is there a way you can deal with that kind of situation? Okay, so one thing I do want to be clear, it's when, when you're talking about managers, it's a small segment of individuals who are stealing yes. credit for the idea of others. I just it's want a to very small, clear. very small yeah, segment. It, yes. it is it is very small because I think so many managers are so gracious about extending compliments and not just compliments saying this person is the one or this team deserves the credit. Back mm -hmm. to your question, Elizabeth. How, how do you handle um, when someone is, is taking credit for the ideas of others? First of all, um, it's important to give that individual feedback. Mm -hmm. And the way I would, and, and it's threatening, I understand. Again, there are other individuals that are experiencing that. Give that feedback collectively to this individual. Mm -hmm. If it's only you, um, then it's it's going to be more threatening and to find someone to collaborate with like someone from human resources to go in with you. So then what do you say to that individual? I think it's really important to frame it positively and talk about uh, concrete and behaviorally specific behaviors. So first of all, to to just say you're stealing credit for my ideas is really quite inflammatory. To that individual. No, I don't. I remember when I did, I gave you credit. So what you want to do is be really specific saying, you know, in the last meeting, um, I want to talk with you about something. And you go through the same process that I shared with you, mm -hmm. intro behavior, 
impact toss back. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, I want to talk with you about something that's really bothering me. Mm -hmm. Intro behavior. The last time we were together and um, our, your boss was there, you had shared with her that you were working on this and I supported and I supported you in this. That that's the behavior mm -hmm. impact. When you do this, it makes me feel that I'm not valued because I didn't only support you. I was the lead mm -hmm. on this project. Toss back. How can we course correct this? Maybe there's nothing we can do now. How can we change this in the future so that uh, this good. doesn't happen again? Mm -hmm. So you need to have those critical kinds of conversations with individuals. You need to have... Uh, a way to do this, and I recommend the intro behavior impact toss pack. And I recommend, and I, I do a lot of work with the Healthy Workforce Institute. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we talk about is scripting it, script it ahead of time, practice it with someone because these interviews are highly not part of me. These yes. conversations are highly threatening. Yeah. And actually, one of the things about scripting it is the same if you're giving a speech, actually, as a, as a speaker trainer. You know, it is a presentation. And speaking is a physical act. You have to train your lips and tongue. And if you're emotionally involved, if your emotions are high, you're going to have a hard time saying what you want to say. Exactly. So, and you know what's so interesting about this is the scripting ahead of time and then talking with someone you trust. Many people don't do this. It's a very simple strategy. And one uh, word of caution is that if you find someone who you're practicing this with, make sure that you're not doing it just so that they would agree with you. Ain't it awful? Uh, what a terrible person to have to report to that individual. Yeah. What you want is you want that individual to give you feedback on what you're saying. Very good point. Tell them you're practicing and you want that. I often think of it as kind of a living mirror. Um, yes. That you need you need their feedback. What's gonna, What makes sense? What doesn't make sense? And if you, they can put themselves into the the shoes of the the difficult person, if you will, you know, pretend pretend you're that scary manager, and then now listen. How is that going to feel to you? That would be um, that's actually an old acting technique. Uh, yes. it's lots of centuries old acting technique. Absolutely. Uh, you know what's interesting about what you just said? If you don't do this, and you really want the person to corroborate with you, ain't it awful? What it becomes is a form of gossip. It's a subtle way of gossiping about that individual. Mm, that's and right. if that, and if your intent isn't that, but the other individual says, you know, it's so awful. I feel so badly for you. So you, you need to stop them. No, I don't want to talk about how awful this is. What I want to practice with you is how I can put my best foot forward with this individual and get my point across. That's a very good point. Because we're we're conditioned to say to be sympathetic. And to say, yes, indeed, absolutely. So if you can get somebody to think, to put themselves, you know, to, to think like the person who'd be listening and what's right. going to make sense and what doesn't, that's excellent. That's great. Because we're in the era of tightening budgets, people get nervous. Have you seen that toxic behavior rises when people are scared? Sort of generally scared. You know, it's it's really interesting. You one would think that that when um, people are frightened, etc., we might see more toxic behaviors. And actually, I, I have to say, I have not. Ah, um, okay. And you know, it's interesting uh, when I'm a little line of demarcation about toxic behaviors. One of the things that as part of my work with the Healthy Workforce Institute and that I learned um, from the CEO there, Dr. Renee Fleming, is when you look at these kinds of behaviors, we're looking at three benchmarks. Is it targeted? Is it harmful? Is it repeated? It's not just getting up on the wrong side of the bed or having a bad day. It's that there needs, it needs to be targeted to an individual or a group. And mm -hmm. when it's 
when it's targeted to a group, it's often in organization called mobbing. Uh -huh. So targeted, is it harmful? It doesn't matter what your intent is. If it's harmful to that person, it's harmful. And third is it's repeated over time. So targeted, harmful, and repeated so that um, we're seeing a pattern. Those are some of the dimensions of toxic behaviors that I think are most critical. And I have not found, to answer your question directly, when people are frightened, we might see that more. In fact, it could even be the opposite. When people are frightened, thinking of losing their jobs, if they have a tendency to do this, they're going to be less likely to do it. That's wonderful. That's actually a great, a great way of thinking of it. It just, there's a part of me that can't, that has a hard time um, imagining why people would do that. But then I'm a nice person. I had a, a happy childhood. And so it, I don't tend to do that. And I just have a hard time putting myself into the shoes of the people who are being toxic. Yeah, uh, I agree. hundred percent. And one of the things I say to leaders when I'm working with them, stop trying to figure out why. Um, that's a very good point. Just okay. deal with the behavior. Oh, very interesting. So we don't have to be therapists. And we shouldn't be. You know, it, it, we learned this in Management 101. Let's just pretend. And I, I remember this scenario from 40 years ago when people used to have cocktails at lunches. Yeah. You know, and they'd come back and some people would be a little bit more inebriated. And then you you talk to someone. And one of the things about their behavior you don't want to do is, you know, you're coming in drunk or um, you are alcoholic. You know, we're not diagnosticians. What we need to do is call them on their behavior. Mm -hmm. People are saying that they smell alcohol on your breath mm -hmm. or if it's contemporary right now, you're erratic at meetings. Mm -hmm. And we've noticed this. A number of people have said that you're raising your voice. You're missing meetings. This needs to stop. How can I help you do this? And if if the, the individual has a drug problem, that may come out, but that is not a leader's job to be doc diagnosticians. Like with toxic behaviors, you have a toxic personality. No, many people aren't psychologists, so they really shouldn't be assessing personalities. They should be calling people on the behavior in a concrete and behaviorally specific way. So how does this coordinate with knowing your audience, which is rule number one for a presentation. And and actually now the, the majority of the work that I do is helping people present themselves well in an organization. And then speaking is like, is like the top 10%, but giving a yes. speech is the top 10%. But knowing your audience, the way they like to listen, what motivates them is how you get things done, in my book, at least. Where does that cross the line into being an armchair psychologist? You know, one of the things that a, a general question that's a really good question to ask, whatever the behavior that someone is demonstrating is, you know, help me understand what's going on right now. You're not asking, you're not asking for someone to say, you know, I've had a bad childhood, et cetera. Help me understand what's going on right now. And if they they launch into something like, well, you know, I'm 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 going through a divorce, a, a number of things. You can be empathic and say, you know, I, I'm sad to hear that. What kind of support can I be to help you get back in track here at work? Mm -hmm. It is really important to that, that the manager addresses the behavior. And if they say, I don't know, I don't know how, I don't know if I can, then I, I'm i not the individual, the manager talking within this um, person. I'm not a psychologist. You need to get this taken care of because what I need you to do here at work is the following. Yeah. And if it's possible to say, Maybe you want to consider taking some time off, et cetera. But what's really important is that person here that you are supportive and that you have a team to take care of as well and, mm -hmm. and manage that performance. 
I love that. This is so great. Tell us a little bit more about the Healthy Workforce Institute. By the way, you said Renee Fleming earlier because we were talking oh about my opera gosh. singers. You know what? Because yeah. I love Renee Fleming. <laughs> yes. I think I it's did Dr. That Renee class. Thompson, I, right? Dr. Renee Thompson. You know, this is so interesting. You need to send her a CD by Renee yes, Fleming. I know. Exactly. Well, here's the interesting thing. When we interviewed um, last time, I, I, I guess I didn't talk about um, Renee Fleming. For those who don't know, Renee, Renee Fleming is a current wonderful opera diva. She um, went on a sidetrack leaving the Metropolitan Opera, but now she's back, believe it or not, and she's mm -hmm. absolutely wonderful. No. What I meant to say is Dr. Renee Thompson. Dr. Renee Thompson is the CEO of the Healthy Workforce Institute. I do a lot of work with them and their mantra is to eradicate um, bullying and incivility and the, the domain that we operate there is healthcare. So when I'm working with um, Dr. Renee Thompson and, and again, CEO of the Healthy Workforce Institute, um, we, we focus on health care and how we can help that targeted population eradicate bullying and incivility. Because and I, we know from thousands of articles, it impacts not only personal well-being and team performance, but it impacts the patient experience and mm -hmm. it impacts patient safety. So, You're talking about healthcare as in hospitals and clinics. Yes, as healthcare as in hospitals. I do, um, outside of the Healthy Workforce Institute, I work outside of healthcare as well. But when I'm working with Dr. Renee Thompson in the Healthy Workforce Institute, their, um, her area is um, healthcare. I see. Okay. I'm well, glad you corrected me because you have me on opera on my mind. <laughs> uh, well, you know. 30 years of, of me and th and probably that many, 30 years of me being paid for that and then yes. still loving it and yes. probably that many for you loving it. So that sounds like a fabulous place, uh, a pl fabulous place to finish this. If you have one suggestion for someone who feels like they're being bullied or th that they have somebody toxic who's not being good to them, what's the first thing? What's one thing you can do if somebody here is listening and said, oh, that's me? Okay. One is to take a baby step and determine, this is one question. Um, ask yourself, if I give this person feedback, the way I shared it, intro behavior, impact, toss back. If I give this person feedback, is it likely to backfire? So ask mm -hmm. that of yourself. And, be, and if you determine that it's likely to backfire, it's going to be a horrible work situation for you, or you could possibly be fired if it's your boss. Ask someone you trust that same question mm -hmm. and then make a decision. And if the decision is to say nothing, then you need to have a plan B for yourself. Uh -huh. Plan B could be, I'm going to let this go. And when I'm treated this way, I'm going to let it go over my head. And if you can't do that, then you have a decision to make. If you're not going to give the individual feedback or try that process to give mm -hmm. the feedback, then what's really important is that you, your plan B then becomes one is maybe I need to look for another job. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very useful. Mitch Cusey, thank you so much for being my guest again. This again, I loved it. Well, okay. I hope you'll ask me again. Well, one of these days, you and I are going to be in the same city at the same time, and we'll go to the opera together. How's that? I would absolutely love that. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host. If you enjoyed this episode, tell your friends. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Subscribe to us on uh, whatever podcast app you're listening to. And please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That's the one that counts. We need reviews. We need followers. And thanks again to Dr. Mitch Cusey for being my guest. This has been Elizabeth Bachman. I'll see you on the next one. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. 
If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.